For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes. Lord, increase our faith. Even if we are acting like children who do not get their way. So this is my encouragement for you to seek and search the Action Bible. Hello, shalom, and God bless. Thank you guys for joining my sermon this week. Today is the day the Lord has made, so be sure to rejoice and be glad in it. Let's give thanks and praise to God for his marvelous word that we get to read from today, who is also his son, Jesus Christ, the embodiment of his word, and whom we have salvation in. So let's thank him for that salvation. Let's thank him for the gift of his grace, his mercy, and his kindness his love that he extended to us through his son and let's thank him for all of these great things before we dive into these words today let's ask god for his wisdom understanding and knowledge let's ask to be led by his holy spirit so that we can come to complete and mutual understanding of his word and peace and edification by that word all right so we're right at the very end of jesus's sermon on the mount and he's going to give us uh, some symbolism and we're going to go through some of the symbolism in the Bible and he kind of wraps up all of his teachings on the Sermon of the Mount in this symbolism. So let's journey through the Bible and kind of get and understand what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the rock, when he talks about the storms and the winds that come and beat against the house, what it means to build a house or what it means to build a temple, uh, sand, water, all of these things that Jesus talks about, let's find the meaning in the Bible. Let's see where Jesus draws his teachings from so that we can really understand his words. Because if we have salvation in Jesus, then we really need to understand what he is talking about, who he is, and why he makes these comparisons, and why he uses the, the words that he uses in his teachings. Uh, so let, without further ado, let's close out the Sermon of the Mount with the very end of Matthew chapter 7. Alright, so here we are with the words on the screen. We're going to read verses 24 through 27. The wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it fell with a great crash. So as promised, let's look at some of the words that Jesus is using here and the symbolism that he is pulling from the Old Testament. So let's first look at the rock because here the rock is very important. It's what we do to put Jesus' practices in, into teaching and build our houses. Our foundation should be built on the rock. So what is the rock? So let's go to some Old Testament scriptures. So first off, let's read Deuteronomy 32 verses 3 and 4. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. So who is the rock? It's God. God is our rock. So Jesus is basically saying that anybody who listens to me is also listening to God. He's making a comparison between himself and God. If the words he is speaking are true, and if he is truly our savior, then he also is our rock, just like God is our rock. So Jesus and God are one. God and God's word are one. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 and this is hannah's prayer we'll read the first two verses uh, which read then hannah prayed and said my heart rejoices in the lord and the lord my horn is lifted high my mouth boasts over my enemies for i delight in your deliverance there is no one holy like the lord there is no one besides you there is no rock like our god so if there's no one holy like God, but Jesus is holy, then we can make that comparison again to Jesus and God being one and us building our foundation on him, on his teachings. So let's move on to Psalm 18. We'll read verses 2 through 6. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. All right, so this is a very good comparison to the words that Jesus tells us on the Sermon of the Mount. He's talking about the cords of death, destruction overwhelming him, the cords of the grave coiled around him. So when these things come, these things can be compared to the storm. And when these things come, we have our rock, we have our deliverer, we have our stronghold, we have our temple. Uh, so all of these, these these things we see in Jesus' teachings as well, that if we base our teachings on him, we will not be ensnared by death. We will have everlasting life. This is what Jesus tells us. Uh, we can also be saved from our uh, immediate um, troubles, all our, our immediate uh, trials and tribulations that we have in life. We can call on God for help. And opposite of that, the rock is what we build our foundation on to never be shaken. He also says if we build our teaching anywhere else, if we have a different foundation, it's like building our house on sand. Well, what is the comparison we can make to sand? Sand is like a multitude of people. If we follow the masses and what the masses tell us, they are going to lead us astray. Um, so let's go to Genesis 32 verse 12. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So I pulled out this verse because it's talking about people. His descendants are going to be many. They're going to be uncountable like the sand of the sea. But we see here the comparison between sand and people and not just people, but a large group of people or a large number of people. So let's go to Isaiah now and see what God has spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 48 verses 18 through 22. If you had only paid attention to my commandments, your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand, your children like its num numberless grains. Their name would never have been blotted out or destroyed but from before me. Leave Babylon, flee from Babylonians. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth and say, The Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow from them for from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. So the same symbolism we see in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we see a lot of it here. A lot of all of which we've just talked about. The descendants being like sand, being uncountable people. Uh, leaving Babylonians, uh, who also could be like sand, uh, whose teachings aren't going to be like God's rock, like his solid foundation. And then again he talks about the rock. Uh, he said that he made water flow from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. He's also talking about there's no peace for the wicked. Um, so if we've built our foundations on the rock, we will have peace. Uh, yet if we built our foundation on the sand, on the mul multitudes of people, if we listen to the masses rather than to what Jesus has told us, rather than the word of God, the Bible, um, then there will be no peace for us and we will be like the wicked. And so I'd like to turn our attention to verse 21 there. When he's talking about water flowing from the rock, this is actually a story that goes all the way back to Exodus. Uh, so Jesus is our rock and water came from that rock. And we're going to kind of make this comparison using the symbolism that Jesus uses. Let's go do a teaching from Paul and then actually read that excerpt from Exodus. So this is 1 Corinthians 10 verses 2 through 4. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So Paul has made that connection for us. He's revealed a mystery to us that the rock that the Israelites had split open to get their water was actually Christ. And it was actually spiritual drink, not just uh, physical nourishment, not just something to quench their thirst. Uh, th this was spiritual drink for them. So let's make that connection. Let's go back to Exodus and read from that now. So this is Exodus 17 verses 6 and 7. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, 
Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So notice the Israelites are doing this to Jesus and his time in the Gospels. They're trying to test to see if the Lord is among them or not. They don't really see his work. Even though Jesus is performing all of these miracles and doing the works of God, they don't really see it and they question whether if, if God is with them or not. Remember that Jesus is God with us. He is Emmanuel as prophesied by Isaiah. Um, so there's actually two instances this happened. The first time, God does tell Moses to strike the rock and water comes from it. The next time, uh, God tells us just to speak to the rock, yet Moses strikes it in disobedience to him. So let's read from that. So this is Numbers 20 verses 7 through 12. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock and Moses said to them, Listen you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. So notice that all that Moses and Aaron had to do was speak to the rock, yet they struck it instead. Just as they were instructed before to strike it, they thought they would strike it again. Yet this time, God just tells them to speak to the rock. So for comparing Jesus to the rock, and if the Israelites were rejecting God, they were rejecting the rock, asking if God was really with them or not, uh, then when they struck the rock, um, they were striking Jesus. They weren't speaking to Jesus. All we have to do is speak to Jesus, and we can get that living water. Uh, Jesus tells us that he is the living water, and all we have to do is ask for it. Uh, so let's make the comparison because this happens in the Gospels where they actually strike the rock instead of simply just speaking and listening to him. So let's read from John 19, 34 and 35. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may also believe. So we see the Israelites reject Jesus and a Roman soldier uh, who was there at his crucifixion pierced him. He struck him and water came out, much like the water that came out of the rock after the Israelites had struck it, after Moses had struck it. Uh, so Jesus is our rock. He contains the living water, but instead of striking him, we should be speaking to him. All we have to do is ask him and he will pour out his spirit to us. And that spirit is, is compared to water. And let's go to some scriptures that tell us that. So let's go again to the Gospel of John, John 7, 38 and 39. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom the, those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So as Paul had said, that the water is our spiritual drink. And here we see a comparison between the Holy Spirit and this living water that will flow from within us, that purifies us, that cleanses us. Much like the, the Hebrew people would have thought the water flowing from the rock, this living water, which means kind of a, a water that's not stagnant, but is flowing, that has life within it. Uh, so this, this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is compared to this living water that has life within it. Uh, that does not allow us to ever go thirsty ever again, just as Jesus tells the woman at the well earlier in God's, John's Gospel. So let's read from that story now in John 4 verses 10 through 14. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? 
Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank it from him himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become, become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So notice there in verse 10 that he says that all we have to do is ask him and he would have given us this living water. Yet the Israelites did not do that. They had to strike him. We had to see Jesus die in order for the water, the Holy Spirit, uh, to, for us to be able to receive that. Uh, but again, we don't have to keep striking him. All we have to do is ask him. He's already been stricken, right? He was on the cross. Uh, he was pierced and blood and water flowed from him. He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now all we have to do is ask. All we have to do is speak to the rock. But of course, if we do not speak to the rock, if we do not build our foundation on his teachings, then he talks about this storm, these winds and these waters that come and beat against the house. So what is this symbolic of? Well, it's symbolic of the storms and the storms are symbolic of trials in our lives. So let's read Proverbs 1, 27 through 33. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke. They will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease, without fear of harm. So again, we see Jesus' teachings on the Sermon of the Mount very evident here. He says this to us that if we build our houses on his teachings, if we listen to him, we can be at safety and be at ease when calamity, when the storm comes and tries to sweep over our houses and destroy us. He says the waywardness of the sumpil will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. These are people who have built their house on the sand, on the, the, the teachings of people, the teachings of man and not the teachings of God. Uh, so we must accept his advice and we must accept his rebuke. We can't uh, deny it. We can't spurn his rebuke, uh, but we must accept it in order for us to have that solid foundation. So let's read another proverb, Proverbs 10 verses 23 through 25. A fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes, but a person of understanding delights in wisdom. What the wicked dread will overtake them, what the righteous desire will be granted. When the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. Notice that word forever. God's gift is eternal life. This is what Jesus promises us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, with that water from the rock, that we will stand firm forever despite trials and tribulations in our lives. Yet when that storm comes and the wicked are there, they're going to be gone. They're going to be swept away with the flood. Why? Because they did not build their house on a solid foundation. They do not uh, get to enjoy the gifts of eternal life because they ignored Jesus. They ignored his rebuke. They ignored his correction. They did not listen to wisdom or understanding. They did not delight in those things, but they delighted in wicked schemes and in, in evilness in wickedness. This is the same symbolism that we see with Jesus and the disciples on the boat. So let's read Luke 8, 22 through 25. Jesus calms the storm. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, master, master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. So in this story, the storms are the trials and tribulations in our lives. And the disciples, we see, when they don't place their faith in Jesus, they become afraid. They become um, in disarray. They become panicked. They don't know how to handle the situation. But with Jesus, we're able to handle all of the storms. He's able to subside them for us. We're able to get through because he is our rock. He is our anchor on a very shaky boat.
So now we've gone through a lot of the symbolism that Jesus talked about, but we still haven't talked about building on the foundation. What are we building exactly? Well, Paul reveals this mystery in 1 Corinthians 3. We're going to read verses 9 through 23. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed but with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So we'll stop here. Let's notice that there he's talking about a fire testing each person's work. This fire can also be like the storm, those trials and tribulations in life that are going to test us. They're going to test how well we are in our faith, how firm we are in that faith, how we've built on that solid foundation that is Jesus Christ. So let's read on verse 14. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. So notice here he says that we are God's temple. Collectively, as believers, we all harbor the Holy Spirit. So if we build ourselves on our foundation of Jesus Christ, our temple will be strong. Um, if we've used the, the sufficient materials that God has given us, if we build ourselves up, not only ourselves, but each person around us that believes in Christ, we will have a reward. If what has been built survives the test, the trials, then we will receive a reward. Uh, but if we did not use the correct materials, if we did not use the teachings of Jesus Christ, we'll be burned up, yet that foundation will still be there, so we'll be saved. Uh, we can rebuild, yet um, we don't want to be burned up. Jesus is like our, our house insurance. If our house burns up, uh, we'll survive, but we, we won't have much left. Uh, so he is our foundation, but we still have to be building up the church. We have to be building up the temple with his teachings. As he says in verse 18, we can't be wise by our own standards, but we should be wise in Christ. We should become fools, uh, kind of acknowledging that he is the wise one and we are the foolish ones so that we can inherit his wisdom. Um, so uh, again, we can't rely on the sand. We can't build our teachings on other people's definition of wise, but we have to build ourselves on the, t the teachings that Christ gives us. So let's read on, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. So for the wisdom of the wise, it's foolishness, it's sand. It's not the solid foundation. We can't build ourselves on the teachings of other people, whether that be Paul or Apollo or Cephas. And even though these people are apostles, they're disciples, right? Uh, and these people teach us things in the Bible. They teach from the Word of God. They teach from Jesus. And if they are not teaching from Jesus, then we should be wary of that and make sure that they are full of the Holy Spirit and actually giving us sound teachings. Because um, we can't build our foundation on Paul or, or Apollos or Cephas, who is Peter. We have to build ourselves on Jesus Christ. And they themselves should be building themselves on Jesus Christ. And we should test the works in the New Testament as well. Because we can't be boasting about their works, but the works of God. So uh, we should recognize the Holy Spirit at work in them boast about Christ and his teachings and build ourselves on the foundation that he gives us on the Sermon of the Mount. So it's important to understand there are many different Jewish teachers, Pharisees, teachers of the law, rabbis at this time, they all had their own interpretation of the law. 
But as Jesus says these things, he's kind of calling those people sand as he is the rock. So this is what is said in verses 28 and 29, the very end of the Sermon of the Mount. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So Jesus, God, the Word of God, has the authority. The teachers of the law at that time, they did not speak with authority because they did not have authority. They did not have the complete understanding of the scriptures. But Jesus does, and that is why he is the rock, and they are the sand, and we can't be listening to the sand. So let's finish things up with the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus acknowledges that he has been given all authority, and then he gives some authority to his disciples, but only to teach people what he has taught them, everything that he has commanded them. So we're given the authority to teach, but only from the greatest teacher, uh, the rock, the foundation. So we should be building our church, we should be building our temple, our, our lives on the teachings of, teachings of Jesus Christ. Everything that he has commanded us, we should be teaching other people to obey. Everything that is given to us in the Gospels and definitely here on the Sermon of the Mount. So with that being said, let us put all of the words that Jesus gave us, all of the teachings, all of these into practice in our lives. If we do so, we will be like the wise man who built his house on a solid foundation, on the rock. We're not like somebody who built his house on sand. Uh, we're somebody who has placed our faith and our trust in God's words, in Jesus Christ, in his teachings, so that we can withstand any trials in life. When troubles come, when temptation comes, we can withstand those things because we have built ourselves on this solid foundation. And hopefully, uh, not only ourselves, but those around us. We have edified them, we have taught them the teachings of Jesus, and we have built a temple. We have built a church full of believers that are ready to uh, stand on that firm foundation and help each other and encourage each other in their times of tribulation and trouble as well. Uh, so that is my encouragement for you today, to not rely on the teachings of this world, to not rely on the masses or what the masses are telling you, but to rely on Jesus Christ alone to be your rock and to use that rock to help others, building them up as you have built yourself on these teachings. And in doing so, we have built up the church. We have a, a group of believers that are firm in their belief and in their understanding of the Bible and the understanding of Jesus' words who have built themselves on these teachings and they can never be shaken, they can never be put to shame because God has placed his spirit in them. Amen? Amen. Give me a fist bump.